Uh, you can get Acts chapter 18 in your Bible. Next time, God willing, we'll start in to study the book of Ephesians. And while there is little in that book that necessitates our knowing the background of Paul's work at Ephesus, I think it's an interesting study and much to be learned from what the Bible has to say about those people and about the ministry of the gospel there. Let me read you some history that I hope won't be too dull to you, but might might even be interesting. I know it'll be informative, but just follow along with me if you will. Ephesus is a city of the Roman province of Asia, near the mouth of the Caister River, three miles from the western coast of Asia Minor and opposite the island of Samos. With an artificial harbor accessible to the largest ships and rivaling the harbor, harbor at Miletus, standing at the entrance of the valley which reaches far into the interior of Asia Minor and connected by highways with the chief cities of the province, Ephesus was the most easily accessible city in Asia, both by land and sea. Its location, therefore, favored its religious, political, and commercial development and presented a most advantageous field for the missionary labors of Paul. The city stood upon the sloping sides and at the base of two hills, Prion and Coressus, commanding a beautiful view. Its climate was exceptionally fine and the soil of the valley was unusually fertile. Uh, then they give tradition about some mythology about how the city got started, which isn't really uh, necessary. It says, uh, Alexander the Great took the city finally, and at his death it fell to Lysimachus, who gave it the name Arisione from his second wife upon the death of Philadelphia, king of Pergamus, it was bequeathed to the Roman Empire, and in 190, when the Roman province of Asia was formed, it became part of it. Ephesus and Pergamus, the capital of Asia, were two great rival cities of the province. Though Pergamus was the center of the Roman religion and government, Ephesus was the more accessible, the commercial center, and the home of the native goddess Diana. And because of its wealth and situation, it gradually became the chief city of the province. It is to the temple of Diana, however, that its great wealth and prominence are largely due. Now, just a side note, uh, any history that excludes religion can never be a true history because people's actions have always been dictated by their religious beliefs, whether they are monetary actions, uh, war actions, or any other type action a person's religious belief is always the chief motivating factor in what he does. Amen? Okay. Um, like the city, this temple dates from the time of the Amazons. That's part of the mythology on the founding of the city. Yet what the early temple was like, we now have no means of knowing. And of its history, we know little, excepting that it was seven times destroyed by fire and rebuilt, each, each time on a scale larger and grander than before. I'll read you another article in a minute that professes to know all about the temple. So you take everything with a grain of salt. The wealthy king Croesus supplied it with many of its stone columns, and the pilgrims from the Oriental world brought it of their wealth. In time, the temple possessed valuable lands. It controlled the fisheries. Its priests were the bankers of its enormous revenues. Religion is the same wherever you go. Never changes. Because of its strength, the people stored their money there for safekeeping. And it became to the ancient world practically all that the Bank of England is to the modern world. This is written around the turn of the century. So we would say now all that the Federal Reserve is to the modern world, I guess. In 356 B.C., on the very night when Alexander the Great was born, it was burned. And when he grew to manhood, he offered to rebuild it at his own expense if his name might be inscribed upon its portals. This the priests of Ephesus were unwilling to permit, and they politely rejected his offer by saying that it was not fitting for one god to build a temple for another. The wealthy Ephesians themselves undertook its reconstruction 220 years past before it was complete. Not only was the temple of Diana a place of worship and a treasure house, but it was also a museum in which the best statutory, statutory and most beautiful paintings were preserved. Among the paintings, and then he lists some that probably wouldn't mean much to many of you, it was also a city of refuge for the criminal. For no one could be arrested for any crime whatever within a bow shot of its walls. There sprang up therefore about the temple of Diana a village in which the thieves and murderers and other criminals made their homes. 
Not only did the temple bring vast numbers of pilgrims to the city, as does the Kaaba at Mecca at the present time, but it employed hosts of people apart from the priests and priestesses. Among them were the large number of artisans who manufactured images of the goddess Diana or shrines to sell to the visiting strangers. We'll read more of that in a minute. Let's look at some things in the Bible now. Acts chapter 18 and verse number 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, which was the chief city of Egypt at the time, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus, the city that we've just read about. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but his own Spirit, being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, this is very important because it proves that a man can fervently and zealously be doing right according to the knowledge that he has and the light that God has given him, uh, but be falling short of everything that God wants and everything God desires. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when he heard, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. This is all part of the ministry of the body of Christ, if we could properly label this ministry of the body of Christ. But the lesson it teaches here is simply this. Our purpose is to minister one to another. And where we see someone who is lacking in some knowledge or understanding, by the grace of God, we impart that to them. Now, I don't consider this a great deed on the part of Aquila and Priscilla, though it was a good deed. The great deed is on the part of Apollos for how many people are willing to be shown that they're wrong or that they don't have all the knowledge they should have. So... Good fellow, good man, he's right with God. Uh, Verse 27, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And that's what we need today, is men that can take the scriptures and show the truth from the scriptures and do it mightily. 19.1, It came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now, the scripture, the wording of this thing you're going to see, Apollos is teaching John's baptism. He gets straightened out and then he leaves. And so when Paul gets there, the people he finds, look what it says. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Now, this is very important, and I'll tell you why it's important in just a minute. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. First thing that's important about this is you can hear what a preacher preaches, believe it, and get baptized and be short of God's salvation. That's very important because a lot of people are in that very condition here in the South. They've believed a preacher and responded and gotten baptized, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, verse uh, 6, When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You remember when we went through the lesson on the signs, wonders, and miracles that God's, the truth of God's word was confirmed by those signs, wonders, and miracles. John the Baptist preached one message. Apollos preached that message. Now here's come, here comes Paul with a different message. We don't have a written scripture at this time. How are we to know which one of these men is preaching the true gospel? God bears witness with the signs, wonders, and miracles. That thing holds true every time in your Bible. You say, did they continue to speak in tongues every time somebody preached? There was no need for it. Why? The message had been confirmed. Okay. Uh, Verse 7. And all the men were about twelve. Not very many people. Just twelve men heard Paul's message and believed it. That's very significant. Thirteen men in a new city. How many were there in Jerusalem? Say 120, but when they went out and preached on the street, 
said Peter lifting up his voice with the eleven. So there are twelve people out there preaching. The word of God spread there. Paul comes into a new city. How many does God save? I don't think it's coincidence twelve got saved. You say, why is that important? We tend to think that the outpouring of God's power and the great revival that broke out in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost was a once for all thing that sadly can never happen again. We're about to read of what happened when a man went into a city and 12 people got saved and the same thing happened again. I am firmly convinced that if 12 men would sell out to God, the land could be set on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see why not. You say, but it's not the day of Pentecost. No, it's today. Today is the day of salvation. Same God, same Holy Spirit, same gospel, same Bible. The only thing different is we don't have the twelve men. That's the only difference. Nothing else has changed. Amen? I mean, oh me, that's a sad testimony, but it's true. Now... Uh, verse 8, he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And w- But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one uh, Tyrannus. Now, more lessons. One lesson is, if people won't receive the word of God... Don't waste your time and beat your brains out trying to make them receive it. Go on and find somebody that will. That's what Paul did. He went three months. They wouldn't receive it, but spoke evil of it, so he went to somebody else. Verse 10, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And he didn't ask anybody for money in the mail by, in, by return mail. <laughs> hey man, I mean, this is the work of God. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? (laughs) And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That must have been a sight. I've often pictured that in my mind and laughed about it. And people say all the time, they say, Brother James, you know, I have people come to me every now and then and say, I know somebody, I think they're possessed with the devil. Would you come do something about it? I say, no, thank you, I won't. <laughs> and I'd like to have the faith and, and be walking close up with the Lord and have the power, whatever. But until that time, I'm not interested in getting beat up and losing my clothes. <laughs> Hey man, you say, well, if you were sure that God wanted you to cast an unclean spirit out of somebody, would you do it? Yes. But I feel like the fellow did about handling the rattlesnakes. Uh, he ain't told me to, and I ain't gonna do it. You know, I mean, when when he does, I'll then I'll respond. But until then, we'll just leave it to to God, Amen, and let Him take care of that thing. Now he says, uh, seventeen. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Isn't it a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ? His name can be magnified through the workings of the devil and counterfeit imposters pretending to be God's ministers. We tend to forget that in the world today. We say, oh, look at all the cults and all the work of the devil and all the false teachers. God can get glory to the name of Jesus Christ any time He wants to. You don't have to worry about that. He said, if if you people won't praise me, I'll get the rocks to do it. Amen. People won't respond to the preaching and teaching of Paul. I'll get them to respond at the testimony of a man possessed with unclean spirits. I mean, one way or another, God's going to get glory to His name, and I thank Him for it. Now watch this. Verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. I'm going to say this, and that's all I'm going to do is say it. I have read the testimony of the revival under John Wesley, the revival under George Whitfield, the revival under Andrew Murray, the revival under Praying Hyde in India, Every revival I have ever read about has been accompanied by people standing and publicly confessing their sins 
and repenting of those sins. I have never read of a revival that was not accompanied by that. In the hearts of God's people today is the attitude that I wouldn't dare say that. I don't ever want anybody to know about that. I'm going to, you know what that is? That is a proof that we are still concerned with ourselves. And when a revival breaks out and people fully and completely deny themselves and fall totally upon the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not saying we ought to do this. But in every one of those revivals, nobody was told to do it. The Holy Spirit of God moved in and people began confessing their evil deeds. Now you say you're going to preach that around here and try and get people to do it? No, because it would be a terribly foolish thing for anybody to do that apart from a reviving moval of the Holy Spirit. It would be a terrible thing for a church that wasn't right with God to have people in that church stand up and confess their sins. It would destroy the fellowship of that church. You say, well, I can't imagine what kind of church it wouldn't destroy. That's because we have never seen anything close to a true revival. Amen. Let's, let's go on. Verse 19, And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. Now, I could stand up here and give you a great long list, but you know what they did? They went home and everything they had in that house that pertained to sin, to the world, to the flesh, to the devil, they got rid of it. You know what's going on? Well, we're never going to have a, a real revival of God in the church because the professing Christians are still surrounded by and occupied with the same things that they were surrounded by and occupied with before they got saved. And some of you are scared to death, I'm going to say the, the T word, and I'm not going to say it. Because some of you haven't looked at it all week, but you ain't prayed all week or read the Bible either. So, I mean, it's in every one of our lives, there are things that pertain to this world that occupy our mind and occupy our attention, and they have carried over from the days before we were saved to the days of our professed salvation, and they're keeping us bound and tied to the old life, and we shouldn't allow that. We ought to bring it out and get rid of it. Amen? Whatever it is, it ought to be gone. The price of them, they found at 50,000 pieces of silver. And I don't know what that is, but I know that's a lot of money. And people say, well, I can't give up that. I paid so much for it, and that's worth so much to me, and I spent a lot of money on this and that. You can afford to give it up more than you can afford to keep it if it's sinful and pertains to the things of this world. Amen? You know, I don't get into this stuff an awful lot, and I'm not going to here tonight. But it is a fact that God is attracted, the Holy Spirit, the blessings of God are attracted to things like praise, Worship, prayer, rejoicing in the Lord, things pertaining to the Spirit of God attract God's blessings. Now I ask you, does it sound reasonable to you that things pertaining to Satan would attract unclean spirits? I mean, why wouldn't they? And I, you know, I go in the homes of Christians sometimes and I see these... Uh, Ouija boards and occult books and psychic books and statues and idols and images and symbols and pictures and things that pertain to Satan. And that makes me nervous. Amen? I remember going to home, you know, things burn their way in your memory. I remember going home, in a home one time and on the coffee table was an open Bible and a Buddha doll. And I thought, I wonder, at, I wonder at night when everybody's asleep, I bet if God would open your eyes, you would see the most incredible spiritual battle going on over that coffee table you've ever seen in your life. So you don't believe stuff like that, do you? Yeah, I do. I really do. I told Eddie the other night, I said, uh, I said, uh, before you got saved, were you into this kind of scary stuff and these horror movies and everything? He said, no, not really. I said... Me neither. I said, but if you were, I said, I said, wouldn't it be something good on the Dixie Lodge at midnight Halloween? <laughs> I said, man, I bet your skin would crawl just, just stepping on the property. You say, you believe all that kind of stuff goes on? I sure do. I sure do. These people believed it so strong. They knew what they were involved in. They knew what they were mixed up in. And when they heard the gospel, they brought everything that pertained to that old life and got rid of it. Amen. 
had a buddy one time, and he kind of halfway repented. And when he got saved, he took all his, his records and his tapes from out of his house and put them out in his garage. And I hadn't been saved long, and uh, I got convicted about that stuff. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to get rid of that stuff. And I got them old songs and those old records and everything. I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to burn them. So I went over to his house and told his wife what I was going to do. And she said, uh, she said, come on. I said, where are we going? She said, come on. We went out in that garage and we got home from work. He said, what in the world? And we were burning his too. Uh, he didn't appreciate it at the time, but I read in this passage of Scripture and I, I said, brother, we're just helping you out. Now, so what was wrong with them being in the garage? He wasn't listening to them. He wasn't doing anything with them. But there was always that possibility that he could have. But once they go up in smoke, I mean, a record don't play too well once it's melted. You know that? A book is hard to read once it's turned to ashes. I think there's something to not putting sin away, but destroying it so that you can't mess with it anymore. I got a picture at home somewhere I'll bring you in sometime. A fella, I mean, he snapped it just at the right time. It's a picture of me putting an axe through a screen of a TV set. And it's right at the moment of impact, and you can see the glass shattering. And uh, they say, why'd you do that? You'd never be tempted to turn the thing on again. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't do you much good. <laughs> you see, you know what's wrong with God's people? They get kind of stirred up for a little while and get kind of convicted for a little while. And they put the things away, but they always leave them in reach with the thought in mind that if I ever want to go back to that, I'll be able to. Why not just get rid of it? So you can't go back to it. Amen. I mean, that's the way to go. That's the thing to do. You get saved, go to your old friends and break it off. And then wait for them to come to you. Amen. Yeah, where they were burning their... Yeah, over in Nigeria they had a a pile 60 feet high of... It was idols, wasn't it? That they were burning and... These people are getting saved out of this idol worship. And they had a bonfire. They had the stuff piled up 60 feet. Burned it up. I'll never forget one time. I've, You know, we've always burned our trash out in the country out there. And I've burned magazines. I've burned newspapers. I've burned wood. I've burned just about anything you can burn. I've burned it. Okay? I kind of like it. You know, something about it. You know, watch things go up. One time we got a fella got saved and he brought a Ouija board out there. And that thing, I mean, the strangest thing I've ever seen is that thing burned. It put off a yellow light, and then a blue light, and then a green light, and then a yellow light again, and then a white light again. I turned to the the buddy of mine that was standing there watching it with me, and he said, I said, "Uh, are you thinking what I'm thinking? He said, yeah, I am. And we both turned and ran. (laughs) You say, well, you're not superstitious, are you? No, I'm not superstitious. I'm very realistic. I believe that anything that's used to conjure up evil spirits and used to make contact with evil spirits wouldn't surprise me if 10 or 15 of them came out of it when it got burned up. Surprise me? Well, I go. I could get off telling stories now, but I won't, I'll try not to do it. Come out the house. Uh, come out to the house on uh, Halloween night, and I'll tell you some stories. We'll have a time. And by the way, I, I'll go ahead and give myself away. You know what I'm going to be for Halloween? A Christian. What are you going to be? A witch or a goblin or a devil or a... What you going to be? I'm going to be a Christian. You know what I'm going to put on and come on Halloween after work? I'm going to put on Jesus Christ and I'm going to put on the whole armor of God. Amen. When you say, what are you going to do then? Well, I ain't going to go out and beg. <laughs> so I knew it. I just knew he was going to say something about it. Oh, you just wait till Sunday. We just might have a time Sunday. Get all them mamas and daddies in here. Say, so why you get that kind of stuff? Because I got sense enough to spend a little time and do a little reading and find out what it's really all about. You say, that's not why we do it. It may not be why you shoot heroin, but it'll still kill you. People are funny, you know. Somebody comes along and says, you know, everybody that is a Satanist says that this pertains to the worship of Satan. And you say, well, that's not why we do it. Do you think the devil cares why you do it, just as long as you do it? Let's go on. I'm not going to get on that tonight. I'm not going to do it. Verse 20. 
so mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. You know what? We pray and we ask and we wish that God's Word would grow mightily and prevail, but we don't want to burn the trash. And the trash burning comes before the Word of God working mightily and prevailing. Thank you, thank you for that muffled, uh, pained amen. (laughs) But I'm telling the truth. It's the truth. And we want, all we want to come in and see a great revival and then go home and see the ball game. It's not going to work that way. 21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit. He passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem. And uh, you go on here and he says he sent to Macedonia two of them that ministered to him. Verse 24, a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, notice what they put first in their wallet, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And you never see God's people rushing into the theater. That's just a little sidelight. That's not in the text, or it's probably not even in Schofield notes, but I just thought I'd give you that. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not, and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. No, I've got, I've got to stay with it. I'm going to go on. I'm, I'm not going to preach on that, but that'd make good preaching right there, wouldn't it? Amen. Some of y'all glad I'm in a hurry tonight, but... I... Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. I've been in churches like that. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. I've been in those kind of meetings too. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with a hand and would have made defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians for two hours. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the, well, 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 the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly, for ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire concerning other matters, it should be determined in a lawful assembly, for we're about to get in trouble and they dismiss the assembly. Now, let me read you about this Diana of the Ephesians. And I am going to do my best as I read this, not to mention anybody's church or religion, but I am only going to say this. Man has not changed since he left the Garden of Eden. And either he worships the true God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, or he will end up part of Satan's religion, and it's all the same. It's all the same. Now listen to this. Diana, a deity of Asiatic origin the mother goddess of the earth, known as Mother Earth or Mother Nature. She is is the goddess of every newsman on your TV. He gives her credit for the weather. Uh, Her seat of worship was the temple in Ephesus, the capital of the Roman province of Asia. Diana is but the Latinized form of the Greek word Artemis, yet Artemis of Ephesus should not be confused with the Greek goddess of that name. Tradition says that Diana was born in the woods near Ephesus where her temple was built when her, when her image of wood fell from the sky, probably Jupiter. Also, according to tradition, the city which was later called Ephesus was founded by the Amazons 
and Diana was the deity of those half-mythical people. Later, when Ephesus fell into possession of the Greeks, Greek civilization partly supplanted the Asiatic, and in that city the two civilizations were blended together. The Greek name of Artemis was given to the Asiatic goddess, and many of the Greek colonists represented her on their coins as Greek. Her images and forms of worship remain more Asiatic than Greek. Her earliest statues were figures crudely carved in wood. Later, she was represented in stone and metals. She bore upon her head a mural headdress, round and circular. You want to see the picture here, like a halo, okay, a round, circular headdress. Represented a fortified city wall from it, drapery hung upon each side of her face to her shoulders. The upper part of her body was completely covered with rows of breasts to signify that she was the mother of all life. Stay with me. The lower arms were extended, palms upward. It's all the same everywhere you go. The female idol, the halo around the head, the arms extended with the palms upward. I don't care what name you put on it, it is the same devil's religion. Uh, the lower part of the body resembled a rough block as if her legs had been wrapped up in cloth like an Egyptian mummy. In later times, Greek followers represented her with stags or lions at her side. Most renowns of her statues stood on the platform before the entrance of her temple in Ephesus. As the statues indicate, she impersonated all the reproductive powers of men, of animals, and of all other life. At the head of her cult was a chief priest, originally a eunuch, who bore the name and later the title of Megabizos. Under him were priests known as Essenines, appointed, perhaps from the city officials, for but a single year. It was their duty to offer the sacrifices to the goddess in behalf of the city. Other subordinate classes of priests uh, had duties that were now obscure. The priestesses were even more numerous. See, they had one or two priests, or three or four of them, but they had a whole bunch of priestesses. Why is that? Well, uh, they probably from their great numbers were called milicii or bees. The Ephesian symbol, therefore, which appears commonly on the coins struck in the city is a bee. These priestesses, which in early times were all virgins, uh, were of the three classes. It is no longer known just what the special duties of each class were, but this much is known. The ritual of the temple services consisted of sacrifices and ceremonial prostitution, a practice which was common to many of the religions of the ancient Orient and which still exists among some obscure tribes of Asia Minor, not to mention the largest professing Christian church on the face of the earth. But I won't mention it. For those of you that haven't done enough reading, you will look at me like, well, what's he talking about? But the Temple of Diana was not properly the home of the goddess, but it was a shrine, the chief one devoted to her service. She lived in nature. She was everywhere, wherever there was life, the mother of all living things. All offerings of every possible nature were therefore acceptable to her, hence the vast wealth which poured into her temple. Sound familiar? Not only was she worshipped in her temple, but in the minute shrines which were molded after her image in the temple. More frequently, the shrines were exceedingly crude objects, either of silver, stone, or wood or clay. They were made at Ephesus by dependents of the temple and carried by pilgrims throughout the world. Even the terminology is the same. Pilgrims go to shrines, take back replicas of the goddess, and carry them throughout the earth to perpetuate the worship of Mother Nature. Before them, Diana might also be worshipped anywhere, that is, before these little idols, just as now from the soil of the sacred Mesopotamian city of Kerbala, the sons of Ali were martyred, uh, and the Muslims worshipped in front of the soil. The makers of the shrines of Diana formed an exceedingly large class, among whom in Paul's time was Demetrius. None of the silver shrines have been discovered, but those of marble and clay have appeared among the ruins of Ephesus. They're exceedingly crude, and a little shell-like bit of clay, a crude clay figure, sits, sometimes with a tambourine in one hand and a cup, in, a cup, a cup in the other. I, you know what? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go home and pray to the Lord to give you some understanding. I don't say that critically. 
I say it because 80 million people in the world today are part of this religion and don't know it because the name has been changed. Though the shrines were sold as sacred dwelling places of the goddess, that the pilgrims who carried them to their distant homes or buried them in graves with their dead might be assured of her constant presence, their real purpose was to increase the temple revenues by their sale at a price which was many times their cost. I submit to you that man hasn't changed since he walked out of the garden, and unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes to live within you, you'll never change. And if you don't receive the true God, you'll end up worshiping the false God, and he'll be the same no matter what label you put on him. It's the same religion. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Get in touch with me and Sunday morning after church I will take you down and show you one of these statues. And then I will take you into the little shop where the shrine makers sell them at many times their cost to increase the revenues. And then I will take you to the little dwelling outside the temple where the virgins live who take care of and minister to the priests who minister to the big idol and statue in the temple. So what are you talking about? I will take you and show you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's one in every town in the United States, population 40,000 or larger. Now, you say, what does all this have to do with you and me and with us? We are living in the days of the book of Acts. Man has not changed. His religion has not changed. His worship has not changed. His actions have not changed. It is our duty and responsibility to take a God and a gospel and a message that has not changed and present it wholeheartedly to the people of our city and trust and allow God to do the same thing here that He did there. And He can and He will. Now, I read you that because some of you are tempted to say, well, you know, people have gotten so bad and their hearts are so hard and are so calloused against the gospel, I don't see any way we can have revival here in this town in this day and age. It is no different now than it was then. The Lord is just waiting for us to sell out to it. Now, let's, let's uh, finish uh, in Acts. Come to Acts chapter 20. And verse 17, from Miletus, he, and that'll be Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now, Paul's gone out and he's made some journeys and traveled around and, and now he's calling for the elders of the church at Ephesus. This is later on, this is the fruit of Paul's work there. They've had many people saved and that's resulted in churches being established, elders being ordained in those churches. And Paul calls to meet with the elders of this church and Paul tells him here about how he's preached the gospel and hasn't shunned to declare it. Now look at this. In verse 28, Paul speaking this to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. That's the first and foremost warning. Take heed to yourselves. Secondly, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, look at it, first of all, among you, secondly, not sparing the flock. Now, there are two things. Number one, I have to guard my own life and watch in my own life to keep myself from being deceived and destroyed by the work of Satan. And though it may be distasteful and displeasing, I have an admonition from the Apostle Paul to do everything in my power to be sure that the flock is not devoured by wolves. And the best way I know to do that is make certain that you know a wolf when you see one. Amen. You say, I think you ought to always preach about Jesus. I would like to always preach about Jesus, but there's much more that God has given me to preach about than just that. Now, we start in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to preach about nothing but Jesus for about six weeks. But there's more to it than that. Verse 20-30. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. 
Therefore, watch and remember. Watch and remember. Don't forget what you see. Now, I'm going to take a minute and say this. Some of you have been through church trouble. In fact, there probably isn't one or two of you here that haven't. Now, listen. You saw some things. You saw some wolves. You saw some brethren get out of the way. You saw some people try and draw men unto themselves. You've seen all kinds of things. You know what God says? Remember, remember, remember. Because it won't be long, Paul says, till the same thing happens in this assembly and it's going to be very important that those of you who have watched it happen before and remember will stand up and say, There's a wolf! That's why God lets you go through it. That's why God lets you suffer it. That's why God lets you be part of something that seemed very, very horrible. Because it's not the last time it's going to happen. And God will be able to use you to prevent it from happening here if you will remember. All things work together for good to them that love God. You know why I think, I I tell you, I pray for you young men, but I thank my God so often for Brother Ward and Brother Mac. And Brother Jesse and Brother Ray, I thank God that they're here. You know why? Because years of experience teach you things. They teach you to recognize things that men that haven't lived through them and haven't seen them wouldn't recognize. I thank God that these men are here because I know that the people that can walk through that door and it won't be long and they'll figure them out far sooner than I might ever figure them out. And I appreciate that. I have people come to me and say, uh, Brother James, I just want you to be on guard for this or be on guard for that or watch for this or watch for that. From a, a gossiping teenager or a hot-headed young man or a, a busybody woman, I wouldn't pay much attention to it. From a man that's been saved and walked with the Lord 30 or 40 years, I listen. Because the Bible says, watch and remember. I respect the judgment of a man that says, you know, I've been through this before. And this is what I saw and this is what I see now. Listen, I know it's a horrible thing what most all of us have been through with church trouble and stuff. But God will use even that for good and for His glory as the days unfold. So he says this. Verse 31, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul said, I wish I could have got off the negative kick. I wish I didn't have to tell you what was wrong. He said, but night and day for three years I kept telling you what was wrong and what to watch out for. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That is the introduction right there to the book of Ephesians. Because when Paul writes the letter to the book of Ephesians that we are going to study, he is going to tell those men, by God's Holy Spirit and by the word of His grace, how they may be built up and how they may lay up for themselves an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Now, thank God He's put it in the Bible. I look forward to it. Look forward to reading it and studying it and learning it about it, learning about it. But I want us to remember as we study the book of Ephesians... It's a wonderful, glorious book full of things that are true of people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the people that was first written to are people who before they met Jesus Christ were pagan, idol worshipers. Say, Brother James, the condition the world's in today, the condition my town's in today, the condition my church is in today, it is not a condition that cannot be changed By the power and grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? I believe that. Say we don't have any Pauls anymore. We got the Holy Ghost anymore. That's all Paul had. Before Paul got the Holy Ghost, he was Saul of Tarsus, a murderer. See, we're looking for a Paul. We're looking for a Peter. We're looking for a John. We ought to look to the Lord. It's God's Holy Spirit that worked through those men. It wasn't those men. 
It was the Spirit of God that was in them. And oh, if we would but yield ourselves to the Spirit of God that is in us, God would do today what He